Good morning. Praying all is well with you and yours. Uh, today we're going to be in Second Peter chapter three, verses one through ten. Uh, the title of this message is "Will Jesus Really Come Again?" And I assure you, He is. But first, let's read the scripture. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God the heavens of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Whereby the world that was then being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word were kept in store. Received or I'm sorry, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly man. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some man count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. Let us pray. Father God, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for Your Son, Jesus. We come to You in His name. Thank You for what You're doing in the life's of our congregation. Lord, we see miracle after miracle. Thank you for what you did in the life of my daughter-in-law. Two short weeks ago, she received a new letter, a litter, liver, just two weeks after she went on the transplant list. Today, her liver, new liver is responding very, very well. Her body is accepting it. The liver is accepting the body. And pretty soon we look forward to the day that she'll walk out of that hospital. Thank you for what you have done for her. And Lord, we have people in our congregation who are sick, who just had major surgery. Be with him, Lord, as he recovers. Be with those who are afflicted with cancers. Be with those, Lord, who have lost loved ones. Be with our men and women in the military. Watch over them, guard them, protect them, give them some strong leadership, Father. Be with the police officers, and the firefighters, and the ambulance attendees. Just watch over them, God. Use them for your honor and glory. And Lord, use this message to touch lives and change hearts. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In 1942, General Douglas MacArthur was forced to leave the Philippines before the Japanese conquered the islands. So as he left, he gave the Filipino people this promise. He says, I will return. Though many doubted whether uh, or not MacArthur would be able to keep that promise in the fall of 1944, he did return. He returned in power and defeated the Japanese army, retaking the Philippines just as he said he would. Many had doubted the great general, but he was true to his word. 2,000 plus years ago, a man named Jesus walked upon this earth. He was different than any man who had ever lived before or who has ever lived since. He came into this world to live a perfect life and to die a perfect death in order to make sinful people perfect and to give them the chance for eternal life. After He died and rose again, 
he returned to his father. Before he left, however, Jesus made this great promise in John 14, chapter 3, or verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you might be also. Did you hear his promise? He said, I will come again. Many doubted the truth of his promise. Then and many today still doubt the truth of His promise. Perhaps there are some within the sound of my voice this morning that do not believe that He will really come again. But my friend, I'm here to tell you, He's coming. If there is doubt in your mind as to His return, then I pray this message will touch you. Peter had to deal with doubting crowds. In these verses, he handles their objections and provides genuine hope for all those that believe Jesus is really coming again. Today, I want to answer this question. Will Jesus really come again? And as I do, I want to ask you to answer this question for yourself. Am I ready for that event? When Jesus comes back, whether it be today, tomorrow, next year, a hundred years, will you be ready to meet Him? In verses 3 and 4 of our text, Peter shed some light on the nature of those doubters. He says in, in verse 3, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own nurse lust. What are scoffers? That is someone who mocks, someone who ridicules, someone who makes fun of. Have you looked around in our world today? These people delight in making fun of the Word of God. Every pronouncement of God is just fuel for their jokes, for their fun time, to mock God. Their conduct these people made light of God's coming judgment because to acknowledge the truth would mean that they would have to change their lifestyle. My friend, if, you, if you'll admit Jesus is coming back and you're not saved, you need to change your lifestyle. It was always played out this exact way. The people in Noah's day, as Noah was building the ark, he preached the entire time. And they ignored his message. The people of Sodom. God sent the angels. They ignored the message. People in our day, folks love their sin too much to turn their lives over to the Lord. If they could only see the truth concerning the nature of their sin and the nature of of what they face in the future if they don't repent. In verse 4, it says and say, there is a promise of His coming. For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. They look, look back over the last few years of their memories and conclude that He hadn't returned. Therefore, there's no reason to believe that He will. Folks, preachers from Paul on down to me have preached the nearness of His return. Now since He hadn't come back, does that mean we are all wrong? Society would say yes, but the Bible says something different. In verses 5 through 7, it says, For this they willingly are ignorant of, that the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that was then, being overflooded with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly man. Peter reminds us that the critics 
are willingly ignorant. They refuse to, to, to process some of this very important data. They have a very limited vision and fail to remember that God, not them, is in control of the universe. Since He is in control, He can break into time, anytime, anywhere that He desires. And He can do what He pleases when He does that. The critic also forgets it. God is bound by His Word. God cannot lie. And that He will always do exactly what He says. In the book of Psalms 119.89, says, Forever, O Lord, Thy Word is settled in heaven. And in Matthew 5.18, Jesus said, For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. My friends, God, God's Word, it's, it, it hadn't changed. It will not change. The Word will be with us in heaven. God's standards have not changed. It's the world that has changed. It's the world that has caused all this confusion. And the world is listening to Satan. The return of Jesus Christ hangs totally on the Word of God. It is the only witness that we have. And my friend, it is the only one that we'll ever need. Peter gives three instances when God has or God will step into time and change the world. All three of these events are products of His Word. The formation of the world. For this they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God, the heavens of old and the earth standing out of the water. <coughs> Excuse me. He's reminding them that in the book of Genesis, God spoke nine times. And those nine words that God spoke created everything. There was nothing before God spoke, but He spoke and everything came to be. In verse 6, the flood in Noah's day, whereby the world that was then being overflowed with water perished. He reminded these folks, the scoffers in Noah's day, who said, yeah, it would never happen. Noah preached to them people for 120 years. They didn't listen. They didn't think anything was going to happen. But one day, when the time was right, God closed the door. God closed the door to the ark. And the rains began to come down. And there was a great flood. The Lord had spoken. In verse 7 it says, the fire that is coming. But the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. He tells the day is coming when by His word God will destroy the world. The scoffers laugh. Ah, oh, that will never happen. But my friend, it is going to happen because God said it was. The laughter and disbelief will not prevent those things from happening. Do, do you realize God already has all these combustible materials in place? You take oxygen. Oxygen is required for all combustion. It is what fire feeds on. Take away the oxygen and the fire dies. Turn it on, the fire flares. Yet with every breath we take, we put this highly exposing material into our lungs. Nitrogen. Nitrogen is the component that makes dynamite, TNT, and nitroglycerin. Powerful explosives. Yet, every day, we go massive quantities of nitrogen in the air that we breathe. Cannot the same God who made these elements and combined them in such a way that they do not explode also change the mixture and cause them to explode? I say, yes, he can. 
Table salt is one third sodium. Sodium by itself is gray, putty like substance. It must be kept in kerosene or it will explode. If one drop is placed in water, there will be a violent fire. Yet, we eat salt every day. I eat tons of it. Water. Water is composed of oxygen and hydrogen, both extremely explosive, yet combined in a, a manner that makes them safe. All God has to do is speak the word, and the chemical arrangement is altered, and the world, the world becomes a huge fuel dump. Yet, we drink this life-giving substance every day. What about the atom? When the atom is split, a chain, re chain reaction is set into motion that has the power to level entire cities and to vaporize a human. Yet every one of us are made of atoms. Then we have the earth. The earth has been compared to an egg with a hard crust covering the semi-liquid center. In scale, the Earth's crest is the same thickness as the eggshell when compared to the vast sea of lava underneath it. There have been times when the lava has burst through the crust, resulting in thousands of people being killed. Nonetheless, we walk on this thin crust each and every day and we trust it. So you see, God has everything in place, everything in His proper place to carry out His Word as He has said. The return of Christ is a certain event. We have God's Word on it. Jesus in John 14 said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in Me. In My Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto Myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Jesus is waiting. He's waiting. The angels testified and said, and while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as He went up, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye man of Galilee, why stand ye here gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner, as ye have seen him go into heaven. He's coming back, folks. And Paul, the apostle, in First Thessalonians said, For the Lord himself shall descend from the heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. In the book of Revelation, Revelation it says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. The mockers, the scoffers, the other fools can have their laughter, but God will keep his promise. Jesus is coming back. Peter's whole point is this man willfully ignores the truth so that he can continue to live in sin and mock God. Are you one of those? I pray you're not. In verse 8, it says, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. God doesn't view time as men does. He does not wear a wristwatch. God is totally unaffected by time. By His accounting, Jesus has not even been gone two days. The world is only six days old. 
Folks, we must never time God by our wristwatch. He is rarely early, but my friend, He is never late. Verse 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is not dragging His feet. It's just that God answers to no one. No one knows when Jesus is coming back except for God. Jesus doesn't even know. Only God the Father knows. God is a God of order. If you don't believe me, just look at the universe. It is a modest model of precision and it speaks of a precise, orderly God. God has a purpose in everything He does. Even in what you and I call delay. There's purpose in it. Why does God delay His return? He tarries to give lost folks another chance, another opportunity to make things right with Him. God doesn't want anybody to die and go to hell. In Matthew 25 it says, Then shall He say unto also unto them on the left hand. Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Jesus came to die because God sent him. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus calls you to Himself. He says, No man can come to Me except the Father which hath sent Me draw him, and I will raise him up in the last day. Jesus tarries His coming and delays His judgment. First Timothy says, Who will have all men be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth? Jesus wants you to know the truth. God wants you to know the truth today. And the truth is, if you die without Jesus, you're going to hell. The final decision rests on your shoulders. Jesus says, come. In order to come to Him, you must be willing to make room in your heart for Jesus to repent of your sins and receive Him into your life. God's gone as far as He's going. Now He awaits on you. It's your turn. It's your move. The ball's in your court. God's delay is to give you the opportunity to repent. Will you do it? He's not going to wait forever. One day the sky's going to split. That's going to be a shout and that trumpet's going to blow. And if you don't have that intimate, personal love, love relationship with Jesus Christ, my friend, you're going to be left behind and you're going to be bound for hell. It's a fact. Christ is coming. He is returning for His people. Those who are ready to meet Him he delays His return today because He loves you and doesn't want you to die lost. He tarries to give you an opportunity to repent and come to Him. This is an offer based totally on His grace and on His love. We've done nothing to merit salvation. We get it because of God's grace and God's love. Are you ready to receive it? The world can scoff. They can mock. But when Jesus comes, the bottom line is, will you be taken up into rapture? Or will you be found lost, judged, and sentenced to hell.
God's already made the decision, His decision. <laughs> he loves you and has made a way for you to be saved. Now, it's your turn to make a decision. What will it be, heaven or hell? What will you do with Jesus? Whatever you need to do, now is your time. If you're lost and you want to be saved, just get on your knees right where you're at and pray a simple prayer to Jesus. Lord, I am a sinner. I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you went to the grave and rose again. I believe today you sit at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Lord, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Take control of my life. Use me for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it in your heart, if God saved you, then you may ask, what comes next? Well, you need to find you a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching, Bible-preaching church and get involved with it. You need to find you a quiet time to read, study God's Word, to pray and listen to Him, what He has to say to you. You need to follow Jesus in scriptural baptism. And you need to tell others what Jesus has done for you. Let us pray. Father God, thank you for your word. Pray that if you have anyone that got saved today, the Lord, they would do what they need to do and that's to find that church to get involved with it. And Lord, you just forgive us where we fall short and use us for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.